Good afternoon. Welcome to UCL's lunch hour lecture. I am uh, very pleased to introduce today's lecture, Speaking My Mind or Being Myself, How Should European Law Treat Religious Expressions at Work? And uh, here we, are, we have Dr. Ronan McRae uh, to deliver the lecture. Ronan is a senior lecturer at UCL Law and an expert on, on these issues, which uh, he has explored um, in uh, his double capacity, both uh, in his work at the Court of Justice of the European Union in Luxembourg, and of course also in his academic research, in his uh, articles, numerous articles at the Modern Law Review, but also in his uh, acclaimed uh, mo monograph um, published with uh, Oxford University Press in 2010 and republished, uh, I believe, in the paperback version in 2013. The monograph is uh, entitled Religion and the Public Order of the European uh, Union. I will give the floor uh, to Ronan in, in a second, uh, but uh, before I do, I would like to uh, have a... Um, a suggestion for you, uh, get you to, to think as well and work as well. At uh, some point in his uh, lecture, Ronan will uh, be asking you a question, um, and if you would like to answer it by yes or no, um, you can do that on your phone, uh, logging onto uh, the following uh, website, https uh, slash, slash uh, entering the event code, which is U234. Thank you. Uh, Ronan, I'll give you the floor. Thank you all for coming. Um, can you, you can hear me? Yeah. Good. Uh, you can, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Miriam, for sharing and the event team for all their work setting this up. So, speaking about religion in public, always brings, and probably should bring, a degree of trepidation. Because to talk about religion in society in today's Europe is not really only to talk about religion, but also to talk to some degree about a host of other controversial issues, uh, including um, issues that are very uh, emotive and controversial. Hold on, should be close. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that, I'll just hold it, thank you. That, uh, that are very controversial and emotive in their own right. So talking about religion is, in, is inextricably bound up in Europe with questions such as discrimination, migration, uh, terrorism, feminism, colonial histories, racism, and LGBT rights. All hot button issues in their own right. And actually, far from progressively losing social and political importance, as all the sociologists from Max Weber in the 19th century, from right until the end of the 1970s, all were convinced that religion was going to progressively fade away from law, politics, and society. And contrary to that, it seems that religion is becoming an ever more important element of a whole range of current political disputes. Now, this lecture is a lecture on taboos. So in the first section of the talk, I want to talk about how it could possibly be that something like religion, which is a fundamental right, and which is seen by many people and sometimes by the law as a, something that is inherently good could possibly be something that would be taboo at work. Then I'm going to discuss two cases that were uh, decided together in one judgment by the European Court of Justice which related to workplace rules that effectively made the expression of the religious identity of two employees, both Muslim women, taboo. And then I'm going to finish with a discussion of uh, the role and the limits of the role of European law in this area, and then some more general comments about what these cases show about religion's developing role in the context of changing religious demographics in Europe. So one final kind of primer before we get down to the meat, which is that you'll see that underlying most of the disputes in the law about religion's place in society are two uh, different visions of what religion is. One view is uh, that religion is effectively a matter of opinion and belief. It's what you believe, what you think. On this view, religious freedom is 
mainly an individual right. And religious views, if you view them as opinions and beliefs, can be seen as similar to, analogous to, your political opinions. The second view of religion, which is in tension with the first view, sees religion as actually something that's part of your identity. Because actually, in reality, religion is rarely truly chosen. Normally, you get your ident religious identity from your parents, and often religious identities overlap with ethnic and national identities to quite a big degree. So viewed in this way, religion is more like your gender or your ethnic identity. It's what you are, it's not what you believe. And this is important because our view on how religion and religious expression work should be treated uh, depends to a large degree on which view of religion we take. If we see it as opinion, it calls out for one kind of treatment. If we see it as identity, it calls out for another. And this came up in a, an, uh, an article a PhD student of mine sent me two weeks ago about a man who was kicked out of a bar in New York for wearing this hat, the Donald Trump Make America Great Again. He's suing the bar for discrimination on grounds of religion or belief. So the question I have for you, to, I would interest, interest to know your view, is whether kicking someone, it should be treated the same to kick someone out of a bar for wearing a hat like that, or for wearing a headscarf or a crucifix. Should they be treated the same? Well, uh, I think the survey will come up and you can vote. And I mean, I think there are two ways of looking at it, which we will discuss. So. Uh, this is the, oh, okay, here we go. So it's, uh, it's uh, okay, well, Noah's, Noah's losing ground quite a lot. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's see how that changes over time, uh, if at all. Um, okay, so let's think first about how religion could be taboo. So taboos normally relate to some th things that are seen as shameful or disgusting or which involve open disagreement with a fundamental moral norm. And that all seems very far from what we think of as religion. Far from being shameful or disgusting, religion is a source of many or most of our moral norms. And in large areas of the world, religion is seen as an unalloyed good. And actually not having a religion is seen as something that makes you suspe suspect or potentially immoral. In the United States, a very large proportion of uh, voters would not vote for an atheist president. And in many Muslim-majority countries, even those that protect uh, minority religions to a degree, atheism is very taboo, and a uh, atheists suffer from very pretty intense persecution. In most European societies, religion itself is not taboo, but religious expression is seen as taboo in certain contexts. France, famously, has a constitutional principle of laicite, state secularism, under which the state and religion are seen as separate, and those who, uh, it's considered inappropriate for those who represent the state, like civil servants, to show that they belong to a particular religion while they're carrying out their functions. And actually, it's not just France. In every EU member state, religion is somewhat taboo in the political arena. The European Commission has said that democratic secularism is a condition that any state wanting to join the EU has to comply with. And even in countries like England, where there are symbolic links between the state and a particular faith, religion and politics are seen as separate spheres. And it's pretty unthinkable that the state would try to uh, uh, legislate to enforce religious law, uh, as they do, for instance, in Saudi Arabia. Now, the intellectual uh, historian Mark Lilla shows that this taboo on kind of uh, explicitly religious politics that characterizes most Western liberal democracies emerged to a large degree as a reaction to the violence of the wars of religion between Catholics and Protestants in the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, Hobbes noted famously back then that <clears throat> animals kill only to, to reproduce or to eat, but men will kill when they're not even hungry to get into heaven. And on this view, he and other writers saw religion as a source of absolutely unsolvable, intractable political division that was apt to produce violent conflict. And so they developed the idea of secular politics. And this, this idea, which we're quite used to now, but is unusual if you think about it, involved 
the idea that people, when they engage in politics, would set aside religious differences, that they would, that disputes about what God or the gods wanted would play no part in political debate. And this means that to some degree, religious expression became taboo in the political arena. And think about it. Member MPs in the House of Commons would happily say to each other, you should be a socialist, you should be a conservative. If, member, if an MP said to another MP, you should become a Muslim, you should become a Christian, the temperature would drop very quickly. It is, to some degree, more controversial. But this talk is about religion and work, and the workplace is very different from the political, from the national parliament. When you go to work, you're not making a law that binds everybody. You're there to make your living. So to require people from, to refrain from expressing their religion and how they dress risks excluding those who feel that their religion requires them to dress in a particular way uh, from the workplace altogether. And this not only potentially discriminates against on grounds of religion, it potentially reduces religious freedom, uh, by also by preventing people from uh, acting in accordance with their faith. On the other hand, some of the reasons that underpin excluding religion from politics could potentially apply to the workplace. The workplace is a place that employees from different backgrounds have to share. Religion is a very controversial topic or matter that can upset workplace harmony. Most religions, including mainstream Christianity, include very controversial beliefs that can easily offend. Mainstream Christianity, and to probably even greater degree, mainstream Muslim teachings on homosexuality, for example, are very clear about its sinful nature. Christians and Muslims are perfectly entitled to hold those views, but they should also recognize that LGBT people can reasonably be offended by them. So given that, you could argue that uh, to allow a person to dis visibly display their religious beliefs at work is as likely to, allow, to generate offense as to allow someone to wear a Labour Party, a Conservative, a Front National, or a British National Party badge. However, if we view religion as identity, akin to ethnic and gender identity, then what seems like a logical restriction on, um, on someone speaking their mind suddenly looks like discrimination against a particular group. If we regard someone's wearing of a headscarf less as a political, exp as a symbolic expression of religious beliefs and more as a, an expression of personal identity, then preventing someone from wearing a headscarf seems to allow employers to say, no Muslims need apply. In addition, in relation to the headscarf particularly, because um, women and ethnic minorities are more likely to wish to wear a headscarf, the ban will also disproportionately affect women and ethnic minorities. So it risks discriminating on grounds other than religion too. So we can see the problem that the courts face when we look at claims for uh, restricting religious expression at work. There are two contradictory ways of looking at the problem, each of which makes sense in its own terms. And if we, uh, if we see it as a series of opinions, then a total ban on religious and political symbols seems fine or might be reasonable. If we see it as identity, then it's no more defensible than a workplace ban on women or uh, black people. It's this dilemma of two logical but contradictory ways of looking at religion that placed the European Court of Justice in severe difficulty when it was uh, presented with two cases this or recently, one from France and one from Belgium. In the first case, case, a woman called Ms. Achbita was fired by her employee for, employer for refusing to remove her headscarf at work, which broke her employer's rule against religious, political, or philosophical symbols. In the second case, Ms. Buganwi had been fired for failing to remove her headscarf after a client of the firm had said to her bosses, please, no headscarf next time. So these cases became before the European Court of Justice, which is the Euro European Union's Supreme Court, it sits in Luxembourg, because um, the EU passed a law in the year 2000 that outlawed discrimination on, uh, uh, at work on a number of grounds, including religion. It's called, uh, now, both employers said, well, our rules are neutral. They affect all employees equally. 
But under EU law, that's not enough. EU law says that even where on, on its face a rule appears to affect everybody equally, so no symbols of belief at work, it will be considered what's called indirectly discriminatory if it puts someone who has a particular religion or belief at a particular disadvantage. So it's not enough that you say on the face it, 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 it affects everybody. Even if it's facially neutral, if it affects people with a particular religion particularly badly, then the employer has to justify it and show it that this rule has a legitimate aim and is uh, proportionate. Now, there's a whole load of e legal issues in this case, but I just want to focus on one. And that's the issue of justifying a uh, ban on religious symbols at work. Now, in important cases before the European Court, a special kind of judge called an advocate general gives an advisory judgment to the court before it rules. So they set out, the Advocate General will set out what looks like a judgment, but it's just advice to the court. And they do that uh, in important cases. The court doesn't have to follow this judgment, but it usually does. What's interesting in these two cases is, in uh, each case, the Advocate General gave directly opposite advice to the court. In the Atchbita case, Advocate General Kokot characterized religion as a matter of belief and ideology and said it was different from other characteristics like gender, race, uh, that are also protected by um, anti-discrimination law. You'll see the quote here. She says, a ban on all symbols. So the requirement of neutrality affects a religious employee in exactly the same way that it affects a confirmed atheist who expresses his anti-religious stance in a visible manner by the way he dresses, or a political act politically active employee who professes his allegiance to a political party or policies to the clothes he wears. And she said that this meant a distinction could be made between what she called immutable characteristics like gender, age, or sexual orientation and modes of conduct, which said religion was, based on, con on uh, your opinions, such as the wearing of a headscarf. On the other hand, in the Bourdonnoui case, Advocate General Sharpston, the British Advocate General, reached exactly the opposite conclusion. She said, to someone who's an observant member of a faith, Religious identity is a part of that person's very being. The requirements of one's faith are not elements to be applied outside work that can be politely discarded during uh, working hours. It would be entirely wrong to suppose that where one's sex and sk skin color accompany one everywhere, somehow one's religion does not. So we have two judges, very similar cases, characterizing religion in two different ways and therefore reaching two different results. But as with many debates in law and religion, you have the slight impression that the two advocates general are talking at cross purposes. The problems that arise in regulating religious expression at work is not because religion is opinion or is not identity. It's because it is both a set of opinions and an identity. So there's no point in simply saying, oh, it's identity, oh, it's, uh, it's opinion. It's both. So what did the court do? Faced with this conflicting advice, in the case, it, it took a very minimalist reproach. It said, a ban on religious symbols could be justified, but only if it was genuinely comprehensive and applies to all religious and political symbols. This, this will become important. You'll see why that's important later. Now, this meant that Ms. Atchbita's employer, who, who did have a rule saying no religious, political, or philosophical symbols, would find their, their policy easier to justify than Ms. Bougdanoui's employer, who, remember, was responding to a request, no headscarf next time, that targeted one faith in particular. So Ms. Bougdanoui, they're saying, you're only targeting the headscarf. In Ms. Atchbita's case, they're saying, you're targeting everything. Now, Many academics and commentators were very disappointed by this ruling, and they accused the court of legitimizing discrimination against Muslims in Europe. They wanted the European Court of Justice to declare that workplace rules banning religious symbols were against European law, and to require employers to, to allow the wearing of religious symbols at work. Now, I actually think the court took quite an important step. Its ruling laid down that if neutrality is to be used as a ground to restrict religious expression, then it has to cover all kinds of religion and belief. And that is important, because in recent years in Europe, 
we have seen the selective and cynical invocation of ideas like secularism, sometimes gender equality and LGBT rights, with people who have very little sincere interest in those goals. For example, the Front National in France has dis discovered in recent years a love for secularism that it just didn't have before they discovered that it could be used as a stick with which to beat people, migrants or those of migrant origin. We've seen in a couple of German states in the last 10 years uh, attempts to ban the wearing of headscarves by teachers at school, but not the nun's habit. Uh, so I think the court took a very important step in saying that it is not permissible to use bans on religious symbols in a way that selectively targets particular religions. People wanted to go further, but let's imagine it had gone further. Imagine it had ruled that, um, ru that, that um, any rule that seeks to ban all religious and political symbols at work is, is, Ill is illegal. That would have raised all kinds of complicated questions particularly about the equality of religious and non-religious beliefs. Once you say you, your employer must allow you to wear a headscarf or a crucifix, then can a person insist on the right to wear a Front National or British National badge, party badge at work? European law on freedom of religion or belief has consistently stressed that non-religious forms of belief are entitled to the same protection as religious beliefs. So recognizing a right to wear religious but not political symbols would have put EU anti-discrimination law in tension with European human rights law on the right to, to freedom of religion or belief. Would have potentially involved discriminating against those whose beliefs are not religious in nature. Furthermore, even if we see religion as a form of identity rather than as a collection of beliefs and therefore regard religious symbols at work as curtailing an employee's right to be fully themselves, that doesn't necessarily mean that all restrictions on religious symbols at work should go. It is sometimes taboo to be truly yourself at work. We are not expected to be our authentic selves when we're on the job. Often we have to wear a uniform or sober clothes. We have to be polite even when we don't feel like it. We have to call customers things like sir and madam that you normally wouldn't. The philosopher Thomas Nagel has written of uh, the problems of what he calls the cult of authenticity, which says, expects you to be your true self at all times. And that where any deviation from expressing your true feelings is suspect. What he points out is that actually human life requires occasions when we tell lies or don't say things. Lies like, it's nice to see you, is often a lie. Um, or he's, he points out that everyone's inner life is such a chaos of thoughts of hatred and lust and disgust and joy that it's not possible to be, live a human life unless you're filtering things. There are also things it's fine to say to your friends, your spouse, your family that you certainly would not want to see on the front of a newspaper. That is, I think, why the internet's such a problem for politics. If you're planning a political career now, you have to make sure you write nothing that you don't want to see on the front of a newspaper from the age of 10 on. That's not a human life. If you, don't say so, if you haven't said or done something that you don't want on the front of a newspaper, you haven't lived a human life. But that's not to say that there are not major drawbacks to bans on religious symbols at work. Dress codes that are considered neutral in Europe always or almost always bear the imprint of centuries of Christian cultural influence. Many more Muslims feel obligated to wear a headscarf than Christians feel obligated to wear a cross. So, and these bans may feel some Muslims feeling they're unwelcome and excluded from un full participation in society. But despite this, I think the European court got it right in this case. And that's not because I firmly believe that a no symbols policy is necessarily the right approach. Actually, to use an inappropriate word, I'm agnostic on that issue. The reason I think the court got it right is twofold. In this case, the European Court was interpreting EU legislation that covers all 28 states. It's legislation that can only be amended with the agreement of every single state. Now across Europe, people have been, become used to using European courts, such as the European Court of Justice, the EU Supreme Court, or the European Court of Human Rights, a separate court that sits in Strasbourg, 
to challenge national ways of doing things. And sometimes this has had great results. The Strasbourg, the European Court of Human Rights, forced the Czech government to stop segregating Roma children in school. The European Court of Justice made sure that equal pay for equal work for men and women was implemented in societies where feminism was not politically powerful enough to achieve that domestically. But it's a power that has to be very sparingly used. And that's particularly the case for religion and law. This is not just an area where it's politically sensitive. It's actually an area that is changing really quickly and where no one is sure what the best approach to adopt is. The story of religion and law in Europe over the past 30 years has been one of completely unpredictable events and consequences. Who in 1985 would have believed you if you had told them that the publication of blasphemous cartoons would be one of the major issues in Danish politics 30, 20 years later? Nobody. It's very unclear what approach to religion and law works best in a changing continent. Many commentators in France feel they would be in a better situation if the French state had been a little bit more cult multicultural in its approach. But commentators in the Netherlands and the UK often say they'd be better if they'd been a little less multicultural. Diversity has benefits and it has costs. And no one is certain uh, in which approach works best and no magic formula has been discovered. Given that in this case, the European Court was interpreting legislation that is almost impossible to change. Every single government in the EU has to agree to change it. The Court of Justice should be humble about its ability to identify and impose a particular approach across the board. Remember, we'll be stuck with the approach that they take because you can't change the law. In these circumstances, the step of ensuring that neutrality policies are genuinely covering all religions and beliefs and don't just target particular faiths was probably as much as I think it was wise for the court to do. So to finish up, I'd like to step back and look <clears throat> at the broader perspective of what, what happened in these cases means for Europe and religion or what they represent. I think taking a broader view, when we see rules that limit religious expression of work, they're not, that, they not seem in isolation. Actually, they're part of a much broader growth in rules in Europe that are seeking to put limitations on um, people's ability to express their religion in certain contexts. They're seen in lots of areas, civil service rules, um, Often in, other, in many countries, migrants are being required to show, to sign up uh, to liberal or secular values as part of what they call integration tests. We see in British, Britain now there's control that the schools are required to teach fundamental British values. So what do these broader growth of rules represent? Well, I think the first thing they represent that's interesting is a loss of confidence on the part of secular people in the future. What, what I mean is that those who thought that the future belonged to non-religion, to secularism, and that religion was a relic of the past, have lost confidence. And that's partly to do with the changing religious demographics, uh, largely caused by migration, and also due to the fact that the unanimous view of sociologists from the 19th century, Karl Marx, uh, Max Weber, Emil Durkheim, all the way up to the 1970s, that religion would fade away as society modernized has proven false. So having lost confidence that history would do their work for them and ensure their inevitable triumph, and faced with the muscular uh, religious identity of many migrants and descendants of migrants uh, in, 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 in Europe, most notably Muslim migrants, but also others, um, the current secular majority is trying to use the law to reinforce the dominance of secular values and to place limits on religion's role in society before the point that they, that they fear their power will slip away. As a French scholar of uh, Islam in Europe, Olivier Roy, has, has noted, nobody was worried by a Moroccan or Algerian granny wearing a headscarf when she moved to France. But the fact that her granddaughter does so makes them worried. The future is therefore not taking the form that they assumed it would take and they're, they're resorting to the law in, 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 
to achieve that, to try and push things along. The second and related feature of that is um, the degree to which bans on religious symbols at work or in the civil service seek to replace social norms with legal rules. A social expectation that you'll hold off on expressing your religion, you'll be reticent about it in certain contexts like the workplace, is in being replaced to an increasing degree with legal rules that mandate, that force that kind of reticence. I think it's very interesting in the facts of the Achbita case that initially her company had an unwritten rule against religious and political symbols at work that during the course of the litigation was replaced with a written rule. Dealing by, with these matters by informal social codes becomes less and less possible when society comes to be made up of individuals with increasingly different attitudes to religion and its role in society. Increasing religious diversity in Europe is therefore driving a legalization, a juridification, a taking over by the law of this area. But the problem with that is that the law, and particularly litigation and judgments in courts, are very blunt tools that tend to produce winners and losers rather than encouraging people to seek common ground. Once you're in court, you're in there to win. You're not in there to kind of find a solution that we might all be happy with. There are difficult and complicated debates to be had over the future of religion in Europe. There are debates in which it's often very unclear which side a person who believes in freedom and equality ought to support. For example, if a state wants potential migrants to sign up to gender equality and the tolerance of homosexuality on pain of not being admitted to the country, is that a step that someone who believes in equality and freedom uh, should support? Well, there are two ways of looking at that. And in different countries in Europe are probably going to reach different views on how best to balance the clashing rights and interests. Over time, it may become clear that one approach is to be preferred. But at the moment, which one is to be preferred is pretty unclear. In these circumstances, I think we have to remember that co courts are no more enlightened than the rest of us about how best to proceed. And if European judges get it wrong, they risk not only a political backlash, but leaving us with approaches stuck, sorry, with approaches that time may later show to be unhelpful. Talking to each other, seeing things from each other's perspectives, and trying to persuade each other, rather than going to court and I articulating a version of your case that makes you look like the victim and the other person look oppressive, is a much better idea. It's only through talking to each other, seeking to understand each other's perspectives, that we're going to get to sustainable options. So talking to each other, rather than trying to persuade judges in a courtroom in Luxembourg, seems to me the more sensible option. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ronan, for a brilliant uh, lecture. Uh, I would have uh, lots of questions, but I will rather uh, ask uh, the audience to uh, ask uh, questions to our speaker. Uh, can I ask you to please keep your questions uh, short, if possible? Thank you. So at the back. Hi, thanks a lot for a very fascinating talk. I have one thought I want to share, um, well, actually two. <laughs> the first one is this uh, thing about religion being a part of an identity or being an opinion. So I was raised Catholic and I didn't like what I was taught, so I, I quit church and I'm agnostic now. So for me it's not identity because we live in a society where we can make our decisions and if we are raised in a religion that doesn't really fit to what we end up really believing in, we can leave or change. So I think this is a very important part of the discussion. I would be curious to hear your opinion about this. And the second thing is what you said at the very end I think is super important that we kind of talk to each other openly and don't just make it a legal case. But I wonder, I followed the debate for a while because I find it very fascinating. I just think people really have an agenda. Different religious groups have a very strong agenda. So I wonder if it's a bit naive to think that the discussion will be very fair and open, or maybe I'm just pessimistic. Thank you very much. I had maybe one more question um, in the middle. Thank you. Uh, 
I hope my question isn't too far afield, and so tell me if it is. But the question I would have is, what uh, what obligations are put on an employer to respect or to to modify their the employment uh, relationship for a person of faith? Some f uh, the examples I can think of is uh, Jews have um, obligations through their faith about working on the Sabbath. Uh, Muslims have obligations uh, for prayer at, at different times. How must an employer respond to uh, people of faith under their employer? Okay, thank you. There are two uh, very good questions. Um, first, I think you're, you're absolutely right. So the thing is, religion is both identity and opinion. Now, I, one of the things is that I think the right to freedom of religion relates more to the belief bit, because freedom of religion isn't concerned about a religion, all of religion. They're just worried about your ability to choose it and not be punished for being cho choosing it. So often, one of the critiques of the European Court of Human Rights is that they're obsessed with religion as a choice and that this leaves out a whole load of religion as a lived experience, as a community, as is that and the other. I don't think that's a great, a great critique because the point of the religious freedom law is not to cover all of religion, just to ensure the choice bit about religion. And that's right. So I think you're, you're right about that. I think religion law is bedeviled by people with strong agendas making cynical remarks, cynical claims on both sides. I often wonder, I mean, I wonder about the, mo even though I think they're in principle okay, I often wonder about the motivations for people who really want to exclude religious symbols from the workplace. On the other hand, you see um, very conservative, uh, interventionist, illiberal religious organizations suddenly discovering a love of anti-discrimination law that they never had before when, they, when their, their religious expression is threatened. So we see um, many very uh, evangelical Christian groups who are dying to the right to fire gay people now are appalled at the idea of any discrimination against Christians at work. Or Deobandi Muslim mosques who are not interested in religious freedom in Pakistan saying that it's a vital state be religiously neutral in the UK. So there's a degree of cynicism absolutely on both on both sides. In terms of what employers have to do, there was a debate about whether religion should be treated like disability, whether there's an affirmative duty to accommodate. And the decision was no, uh, for two reasons. One, because religion has a competitive relationship with other rights. Sometimes more religious freedom for me means less freedom for you. And that's not normally the case for, say, dis disability discrimination. But the actual duty is, if there is a rule that it appears neutral but affects employees, particular employees of particular regions disproport uh, particularly badly, they must justify it. So a rule that says you must work Monday to Friday, nine to five, will, uh, will affect uh, Muslims or more than Christians. And the employer could say, well, it's nine to five for everybody. But in that case, European law requires them to justify it. They have to show that the reason that it's nine to five and they can't give this person Friday afternoon off is for a good reason, commercial reasons, it's too expensive or something, and it's proportionate, it doesn't go too far. So that's, that's the level of protection they have. Okay, we can take more questions. Who would like uh, to have a question here at the front? It's <coughs> I'm just wondering what place universities, the place of intellectual freedom, and religious freedom um, can play in what seems to me to be an advancement of nivellation um, of personalities. You know, uh, you, you saw somebody, I saw somebody uh, the other day at the campus wearing a skull cap as part of his identity, mm. but um, he starts working in a hospital and somebody will say that's not hygienic or some such thing. Um, this rule seems to be very floating. Mm. Um, I once worked 
uh, along a delightful um, colleague who had very beautiful hair. And then, to my amazement, uh, I learned that she was debating whether she, sh she should get a wig or uh, a scarf when she married. Um, I felt sorry for her with the beautiful hair, but what's my view? What value has that against other people? I mean, right now, uh, this religion that's targeted, what's next? Um, blue tie, red tie, or yellow tie? Is that a demonstration of something that <laughs> should not be allowed? Marvin, then you've got two colors oh, in your well, tie, so. <laughs> yes. Where are we going? Where are we yes. going with this? Well, I think, yes, uh, uncertainty is definitely uh, something we're going to have to live with. I think universities, well, first, we're in UCL, which is the first university in uh, England to allow anyone to, to study here, no matter what their religion was, which is a nice history for UCL. First one to give men and women degrees in equal terms, too. Um, but I think, well, there are certain things. So one of the examples would be hygiene. There was a case where a woman wanted to wear a cross uh, when she was working as a nurse. And it was thought to be an infection risk, and she was working with dementia patients. They grabbed it, so she was, they said that if there's a hygiene reason, that's fine, you can restrict. Because I think that, that's a relatively easy case, because the rights of others. The problem you, you rightly pick out is when we start saying, oh, well, that symbol means belief, mm. that's quite a, that is quite a difficult thing to do because it's very culturally dependent. Um, Can I hear boots on the ground marching? Well, I, I think it's much more, there, there, there are two reasonable ways of looking at it. I don't think that many, well, not everyone, I think there are many, I think it's a good, liberal, fair-minded person could support either position. Because it's true, do, do you, uh, it would be rather uncomfortable to have someone with the British National Party badge working, uh, working in a, as a teacher or in a, in a shop. And it may, could be uncomfortable if someone similarly religious extreme views does the same, the symbolic views is the same. But also then on the other hand, maybe live, and live is, the best is the best idea. I think there are two good ways of looking at it. Okay, well, on, on this uh, note, a uh, very conciliatory uh, note, uh, thank you uh, again for your uh, outstanding lecture. Uh, thank you all for attending. Could you uh, please join me in uh, thanking the speaker in the usual manner?